Welcome to the latest edition of the Giants Hangout. As this is our weekly roundtable discussion, we recap the previous game. We also look ahead and we focus on three themes. Today, we're going to be focusing on another solid performance by the defense, explosive plays on offense, and also some missed opportunities on offense to put more points on the board. As the Giants, they snapped a four-game skid. They topped the commanders at home 14-7. to Lance Meadow, Russ Salzburg, Howard Cross with you here on the Giants Hangout. And Howard, I want to start with you, and I think we should pick up where we left off a bit last week because the defense did a nice job keeping Josh Allen and company in check, and they held them to 14 points. You move the calendar forward another week. Well, they held the commanders to seven points, and let's be honest, if Washington doesn't get the turnover off the muff punt by Sterling Shepard, who knows if they even put any points on the board. So you're starting to see some consistency on the defensive side of the ball and another encouraging performance. Yeah, you know, I think that Dexter Lawrence had such a great game up front. You know, and unfortunately, Nick Gates was the, was the was the benefactor of that, uh, and so did so did Lenny. Lenny, Lenny had a great game. Uh, you had Thibodeau coming in making great plays, which which was awesome. The Karake, another solid game, and you know you can't say enough about uh, Banks. At, at, you know, at the rookie corner, he's playing against some of the better you know better receivers in, in our league. And you know, holding them down, which is really impressive. He's he's doing a great job as, as a as a rookie at that position. Um, and if he keeps it up, he's might may win a few awards this year. Uh that defense, you know, has done a great job. It, there's not a lot of not a lot of explosive plays against them. Any plays that are made are given, you know, given up very, very sparingly now. And they seem to be getting into their rhythm, especially now that that you see a better play out of out, out of Dex. I mean, Dex has been solid all year, but now he's like, you know, getting to the quarterback more. And when he gets to the quarterback up the middle, it causes all kind of havoc for the other guys. Yeah, yeah you know, Howard, I'm I'm glad you mentioned. I mean, there's a lot of guys we can talk about, but Banks to me was not because of the interception. He he made one play, which to me might have been the saving play of the game. When it was third and nine at the 15, just before the Leo, you know, block field goal, mm -hmm. uh, that was a little outlet pass screen, whatever to, to McLaurin and his closing speed on that. It looked like McLaurin was going to get a first down his closing speed by banks mm -hmm. made it a fourth and three. And they subsequently went for the field goal, because I'll tell you what, if they score that, if they get that first down, I was saying to myself, sitting in the press box, you know what? They're going to score a touchdown, and now I'm wondering if Ron Rivera is going to go for two. You know, it was that yeah. kind of thing. So I thought Banks w w was tremendous. I thought that was the clutch play. It, it, there were a lot of clutch plays with the sacks, yeah. and as you mentioned, Leo and, and the block. But but mm -hmm. that was the play right then and there. Yeah, I mean, it, it was a big moment in the game. I, and I, I'm telling you, he he did a really good job cover, cover McLaren, you know, over, over routes. Uh, the last little, the little flare route he ran out there in the flat, trying to get him to the first down. Um, he did really good on the deep ball. I think he only missed one opportunity on the deep ball. So, yeah, the kid's playing good. Howard, to your point earlier when you said Dexter's been having a good season, but maybe from an optics standpoint, right? It's not necessarily showing up every game. And that's, to me, what stood out, I would say, guys, overall about the defense yesterday. You were going up against a commander's offensive line that gave up an NFL high 34 sacks. So here was a matchup where you were saying to yourself, okay, could the Giants take advantage of a team really in rougher shape than them on the mm -hmm. offensive side of the ball? And it showed up. You get six sacks when you only had five in the first six games. And Howard, as you were alluding to, Dexter Lawrence, he got two. Kayvon Thibodeau, Bobby O'Karake making plays. The cornerbacks. Remember, Dory Jackson was inactive yesterday. So yeah. it was more of the youth movement on the back end. And I think the youth movement obviously benefited from the pressure, but you could point to eight, nine guys on defense, Howard, who showed up from an optics standpoint before we even take a look at the numbers. Well, you know, the other thing is, remember I was saying that they, they had to go back to kind of like peewee football and everybody runs to the ball to make a tackle. There were, there were several plays in the game where I think it was eight guys in the camera shot or nine guys in the camera shot. And it wasn't a short yards and goal line play. They were just all rushing to the ball. So it wasn't an individual making solo tackles, but like the whole team was there to make sure if he gets, gets loose or, or if he gets turned, like there are going to be other guys hitting. So I, I really enjoyed watching that part of it. 
You, you, you know, Lance, when you mentioned, I, I understand what you're saying, that, that the Redskins, excuse me, I'm not supposed to say that, that the commanders <laughs> are in rougher shape than the Giants, but you look what the Giants went into yesterday. No starting left tackle, no starting right tackle, mm -hmm. no starting center, no corner starting cornerback, no starting quarterback. That's a pretty darn impressive performance. Mm -hmm. I, you know, for all the criticism, I mean, th that offensive line was put together with, with crazy glue. I mean, you had Phillips, who, I mean, Phillips at the beginning of last week was on the Eagles practice squad. Mm -hmm. Two weeks ago, you had Pew on his couch. They were f key factors yesterday. I mean, that was a good job by the Giants yesterday. Y you know, people can say what they want. Well, who'd they beat? That was a darn good job. They sucked it up. They gutted it out. And they came up with a performance that they needed to come up with to keep this season going. Yeah, they did. I, I, yeah, I, thought, the, I thought the offensive line did a great job. I thought that, you know, for whatever reason, you know, Washington's front – if they wanted to get pressure, they could get pressure, but they just didn't do it all the time. Uh, whether they were like lackadaisical, whether they just they weren't thinking that the Giants were going to put up that much of a fight, whatever it was, that they put themselves in bad position and the Giants got them. Yeah, well, I, I was, thought, yeah. That, I, I'm sorry, I thought the offensive line, uh, the Giants' offensive line uh, was wearing down. I, you know, you're on the field watching it, uh, Howard, but I thought in that second half, they were wearing down. I mean, they were putting uh, up a yeoman's effort in that first mm -hmm. half. I thought the second half, it started to wear down. I think like, you know, the thing that you have to think about when you're, when you're watching the game, if you go back and look at it, the Giants didn't have that many third downs in the first in the first half. So the ones that they had did have, I think they were like two or seven or something or two or six. So it wasn't like they were like killing them. They just, the plays they were making were bigger plays. So they were never in third down situation. Uh, in the second half, they got themselves in third down situations uh, more often and they just weren't able to, com you know, complete uh, the plays on third down. And I think, you know, that's a, a spot they're gonna have to improve on is figuring out how to get the third downs. I know third and eight plus are hard to get, but, a lot of the third downs were third and four, third and five, and they still couldn't, you know, find a way to get the, the playoff. Well, they had 16 third downs, and mm -hmm. they converted five of them. So you'd like to see the percentage go up. And you didn't have nearly as many explosive plays also in the second half. And that, to your point, Howard, covers up maybe your need to convert on third down. They had mm -hmm. those seven plays of 20-plus yards. Only one of them came in the second half. But I think what Russ was highlighting, and this was going back to my initial point, Russ, is the fact that, the difference between the Giants and the Commanders in yesterday's game was Washington has a really good defensive front. I mean, they got those four <laughs> former first-round picks. And in fairness, in the second half, those guys showed up. I thought Chase Young played a really good game. But mm -hmm. the difference between the damaging, back-breaking plays wasn't on point with Washington as much as it was with the Giants. So I think the Giants were far more disruptive in the trenches than Washington was. And I think that's what ultimately decided – what turned out to be a seven point game here. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, the, that point, I, you know, I, I can see what you're saying. It, it was just to me, listen, I didn't know what we were going to get yesterday. I, I really didn't know. I, I mean, I show up, this guy's not playing. That guy's not playing. Okay. I, I mean, it was like, huh, how, how are they going to win this game? That was really my attitude. And they, they had a great start and they, they sucked it up and, and hung in there. And now, uh, listen, Howard, you're the former player in this group. I, I, I don't care if you're if it's Pop Warner or mm -hmm. All Pro. Uh, when you come off a win, you're feeling a lot better going to work on Monday than you are when you're coming off a loss. And and I think they have to be. I don't know if the term is exhilarated, but they have to be feeling pretty good and, and upbeat going into this week. You know, I think they gave themselves a message. They, they kind of figured out the defense is going to have to really carry them and the offense is going to have to maintain and not lose games for them uh, instead of instead of like going out and, you know, winning the game. And until they get, you know, a few more guys on that offensive line back and Daniel back in the, in the, in the fold as well, it's going to be going to be that. If, if Saquon stays healthy for the rest of the season and able to run the ball, he will affect defenses. The, the play where he scores a touchdown, everybody's like, wow, what a great play. But the play before that, they faked the ball to him, and you saw the entire defense, the linebackers, everybody shifting across the field trying to chase him, and the tight end catches the ball, and he gets you know, 15 yards, and everybody's like, oh, great play. The next play, they're chasing the quarterback, and Saquon sneaks out. He's 20 yards down the field almost before anybody puts a hand on him. So, the, I mean, his ability to affect the game – 
even with the ball and without the ball, it, it's pretty big. You know, I want to tell you something about Saquon yesterday, and and I didn't have any crystal ball, but I was down on the field earlier. You know, mm -hmm. when the guys with really when they're doing their own individual thing on the field, and Saquon was there with with some coach just throwing him passes. It was nothing else, just throwing him like like mm -hmm. where he's ex a, a taking a screen or you know just a a busted play, just making that move. And I'm saying to myself. Saquon's going to be involved in some kind of passing situation. You know, it might go on the books as a 32-yard touchdown pass for Tyrod Taylor, but that was Saquon Barkley just taking it. And as you say, yeah. he was wide open before anybody was getting near him. That was all Saquon. Yeah, and, and a lot of that stuff you saw, Russ, wasn't so much that he was preparing for the game. They were trying to see what the ball was going to do because it was blowing, the wind was blowing across the stadium and – it, it looked a little funny when the guys on the balls were coming out of the quarterback's hands from Washington as he threw to, towards his own sideline. The ball would keep rising. He didn't know how to put a spin on it to pull it down. So it's you got to have to – like the wind's blowing kind of hard. That's a different kind of game. But, and I told everybody that they're like, man, the wind is blowing hard. So I said, not for Tyrod. They're like, what do you mean? He used to play in Buffalo. So the wind blows a lot harder there. So he, he kind of knew what to do and how to spin it. Yeah, he has some experience playing in Western New York where <laughs> yeah. they don't use the wind and the weather as an excuse to each and every weekend. Graham Gano missing the field goal, I would argue, probably was also something that was impacted perhaps by the wind as well. But yeah, what, it, you guys, it, it, the wind is yeah. blowing across the field so hard. Like he'd, have, he'd almost have to kick it towards the other, you know, other goal kind of the other pole. And that's something that kickers just don't do. They try to like, try to you know muscle it down the middle. That wind just blew it across the blew it across the field. He looked at me. I was like, "Part of it." <laughs> well, you brought up Saquon Barkley. I want to elaborate on that point because that brings us to the explosive plays subject that really came to the forefront yesterday. And as you guys know, I've been calling for this to happen for weeks because I've been saying you can't methodically move the ball down the field every week and go through 10 to 12 play drives and expect everything to go right. It just, it can't work like that in the NFL. And you get six of your seven plays in the first half of 20 plus yards. And this is what Russ was talking about on the Saquon touchdown. Tyrod didn't throw a home run. It was a short dump off past the Saquon. And then he worked his magic. Wondell Robinson, guys, short pass. Then he makes a bunch of guys miss. Darren Waller in the medium range. Then we had the home runs, of course, with Jalen Hyatt. But Howard, what I'm getting at is, the explosive plays came in different forms. Some were off short passes and then yardage after the catch. Others were down the field. And the diversity, the variety of the explosive plays, I thought that was impressive. And that's what really jumped out to me because you need to be able to rely on many formations, not just one guy in particular taking the top off the ball. Yeah, I mean, that that works sometimes. sometimes. And again, some of that is as luck. Uh, the Saquon play again, he had shifted the entire defense with the fake before. And then the second play, he gets to come out and the defense is following the quarterback thinking, you know, we're not going to get fooled by the same play twice. And they just, they dumped the ball to Saquon on the backside and he's out and running. Um, and he's got one guy to beat. That's a hard tackle for, you know, any DB uh, guy running at you at full speed and he can change direction like that. The Wondell play was, was more of a, you know, again, they're following Saquon. He's out in the open. Uh, kind of like what we saw a lot from the Dolphins that time when, when the ball got caught out on the edge and he's cutting back. He got two nice blocks and then the other guys just fell. They, they couldn't, you know, I guess they, they weren't expecting him to be as quick or whatever. So they didn't really like run up to press him. And, you know, by the time you get there, he's already up to field 20 yards. And in the Waller's play, I think it was, it was a, you know, a product of, you know, a quick hit up the middle again. Once Jalen has gone deep a couple times, you can't squeeze everybody down into the box to try to to be there for the intermediate intermediate passing. Um, when Jalen and 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 even uh, Slayton, when they start getting down the field, you kind of have to have safeties back to like kind of help over the top. When you got guys back to help over the top, if a guy catches the ball in an in intermediate pass, there's not a safety bearing down on him right away to get a hit on him. Well, and that's why I think that it's so critical to get everybody involved, to your point. Because what you just laid out, Howard, is you're making guys on defense think. You're saying to yourself, okay, is Saquon going to be the focus of the play? Is it going to be Jalen Hyatt? Is it going to be Wondell Robinson? And the encouraging aspect of yesterday was guys made plays. 
Now, I know this is simplistic and it's stating the obvious, but how many times have we watched games early in the season and there were some opportunities down the field and mm -hmm. guys just weren't making plays? I mean, that's what happened to me yesterday. They may have not finished all the time with putting points on the board, and we're going to get to that in a little bit, but when the ball was thrown down the field, Tyrod Taylor, Jalen Hyatt, they made plays. When Wandell had some space ahead of him, to your point, Howard, listen, if he makes three guys miss, if they're skating on ice, it doesn't matter. It goes down as a big chunk play. No matter how you get it at the end of the day, you just need to be able to capitalize. And that's what we were seeing consistently. I, I think what, what was encouraging to the guys, you know, Lance, was that the offensive line, like Tyrod wasn't getting crushed. And that kind of – they kind of helped everybody else's mojo out on an offensive standpoint. When you're back there and your quarterback's getting up from the fifth sack and it's the first quarter, the people are like, holy smokes, what kind of day are we going to have? And I think him not getting crushed every play gave them all a little more confidence and it helped them out a lot. Yeah, and you know something, Howard? Uh, talk. We, we always talk about complementary football, but you know sometimes just the offense has to be complementary to the offense. What all of a sudden the last two weeks? Look what Tyrod Taylor had in his arsenal. He had Saquon Barkley. Mm -hmm. He had more of of Jalen uh, Jalen Hyatt in the game plan. You know what? You have a guy who can catch a home run. You have one of the best running backs in the league. All of a sudden, defense has to look at you completely differently than they were looking at the Giants' uh, offense the weeks before. Yeah, that they you know that's a big part of it, but the, the biggest part of it is that they're able to hold up a little bit better up front. That allows for the Saquon. You know, there were some plays where Saquon was getting hit in the backfield before he took the handoff. That's just still part of it. But the bigger part of it is like when they actually try to throw the ball, especially in the first half, like once Tyrod figured out that they weren't getting to him, he was able to get the ball down the field. I think that was probably the biggest thing. Because at first, he was like, this first couple of series, we went three and out. He was running, but no one was near him. And he was like, oh, wait a minute. They're not they're not getting to me? Well, maybe I got a chance to throw it. And Coach convinced him, like, just, just let it fly. Let's see what happens. And he did. Well, to your point, Howard, you didn't have an overwhelming amount of negative plays as consistently mm -hmm. as we saw in previous weeks. And I'm talking about sacks. I'm mm -hmm. talking about penalties, too. There were a lot too. of sacks. <laughs> well, no, there were a lot of sacks combined in the game. But once again, not enough to say it damaged or mm -hmm. prevented the offense from being cohesive and yeah. putting together at least drives. I mean, we saw games previously where they would take two sacks on one possession, and you know you're bringing out the punting unit. We didn't yep. see a lot of that. The other thing was the penalties, whether it's the full starts, the holds. You had two penalties on offense yesterday. You had four against the team, only two on offense. So mm -hmm. you weren't going backwards, and you weren't also wiping out positive plays. For example, in the Buffalo game, you have the home run pass down the field where they were getting Jalen Hyatt involved and Darius Slade. And what happened? Evan Neal. Whether you agree or disagree with the penalty is irrelevant. The bottom line is the penalty was called, right? Mm -hmm. And it wiped out that home run play. You didn't have that. Tyrod saw Jalen Hyatt one-on-one -on -one down the field, threw the ball, made a play, mm -hmm. you move the chain. So avoiding the penalties, Howard, I would argue was just as big as getting the necessary pass protection as well. I think that's part of it, but I think, you know, it, just, it goes from crew to crew. I, I don't know how to explain it to, you know, when you think about it, like it, you, I saw things yesterday from the crew that was calling the game that made absolutely no sense. And it's it's nothing against them or anything. Just like uh, end of the game where Tyrod's trying to take a knee uh, and he, and he doesn't go down. He just kind of like kind of hovers back there. The official said, you have to go down. And he goes like, what? Like, you don't have to go down. You, you're back there waiting for someone to touch you or, before if a play is going to interact and it's going to happen so you can't de you can't depend on officials because th the teams have scouting reports on them and they know what they're going to do and we're and they're trying to keep them out of the game but at the same time they're trying to use their strengths and weaknesses if an official calls this all the time you know to either avoid it or look for it during the game so uh the the no penalty thing is just it was just a crew that they had that and that's you know, I, I don't know how to explain it other than that. I'd love to say the guys weren't making as many mistakes or weren't making whatever, but I saw a lot of plays from both teams uh, on the edge where somebody would really have their hand deep in somebody's shirt and almost spin the guy. They didn't throw the flag. I saw a couple plays uh, on our side and on their side where, where the receiver was being mugged down the field 15 yards. They didn't throw the flag. So it goes from crew to crew, 
and you can't really, you know, determine if you're playing great or playing bad because of the officials, because you'll get a crew that'll be ticky tack files all over the over the field, and you'll get a crew that won't call anything. It's the human element. Oh, well, it goes mm -hmm. back to what Russ said earlier. It's like a <laughs> box of chocolate. You never know what you're going to get in terms of out of a game and out of a performance by the officials. So, mm -hmm. you know, what you're talking about, Howard, is the human element. And I understand there could be a penalty or a call on every single play if you put a play under the microscope. So, you know, part of that is going to vary from crew to crew. Understandable. The bottom line is, and this is what I was getting at, is that mm -hmm. they avoided it or they didn't give the officials a reason to throw a flag. And to that point, it worked out to their benefit. And that's part of playing NFL football, as yeah. you can clearly attest to. Absolutely, absolutely. Like I said, we have great scouting reports, including the ones on the officials. So that, that crew was, was, was a good crew to, be a, to play a game against for. Now, with that being said, the other element in play here, Russ, with respect to the offense is you see the explosive plays, but it still was a bit of a tale of two halves, I would argue. First half, you saw them move the ball. They scored two touchdowns. Second half, it wasn't as explosive, and you had the Saquon Barkley fumble. You had the missed field goal earlier in the game, and those points, they add up in the long run because I think Howard brought this up. I would say they're still walking that tightrope where the defense – has to come to the rescue when you're hovering around the team total. You only scored 14 points. You scored nine against the Buffalo Bills. This is still putting a lot of stress on the defense to come up with critical plays and critical stops, as we saw at the last second. Well, I, I, I don't think there's any question. You know, what, what the one thing we got to see yesterday, and unfortunately it all worked out okay. When I say okay, it worked out with a W for Big Blue. But, you know, it just takes – one or two plays to completely turn the game around, turn the momentum around. I, I mean, I, I, I'll be frank with you. I, and Howard, you were on the field, so I you were talking about the wind. I don't know how the wind was affecting um, Sterling Shepard, but the two, uh, he fielded two punts prior to the fumble. He looked lost out there. And, and that really surprised me because I'm watching him all this week, all this past week, uh, you know, at practice, he he looked flawless. I was excited to see him, to see him getting the opportunity. And, and for Sterling, that was shocking to me. But, you know, you, you make that play, a fumble's a fumble. What, 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 Saquon doesn't fumble all the time. He got stripped of the ball. It happened. But some of the other things, I, I mean, you can't have that. And, and to what Lance just said, you know, when a team we know has been having trouble scoring points, when I when I saw Cano miss that field goal, I just said to myself, "Uh oh, this is going to come back and haunt us." It, you know, it, it's but that's the nature of the game. And you know, they talk about mistakes and, and protecting the ball and 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 not beating yourselves. Those are the things that beat yourself. Uh, another big play. I think you mentioned it earlier, Howard. Um, Kayvon. <laughs> that was like an infield fly rule in baseball, <laughs> you know, right in the bread basket. And you got to make that. And, you know, that's the second one that he missed this year. Correct me if I'm wrong. He dropped one where, where he deflected something. And he could have had it, uh, you, you know, going the other way against the Seahawks. Mm -hmm. if, if I'm not, uh, you're mistaken. Got to make those plays. Uh, yeah, it was great. The defense came up. You got to make those plays. Yes and no. Uh, like, and, here, and here's what. I'll go with first. I'll go to uh, to to Thibodeau. Thibodeau has his hands taped like crazy. Uh, he's got them taped in a way where he can just grab a little bit to to make his moves playing uh, deep for the van slash uh, rush in on, on the game. He doesn't have his hands taped like <laughs> Darren Waller or something to catch balls. And if it's fluttering, he has to be like in total total concentration if, at best to catch it. He's not going to reach up and, and one hand the ball with the way his hands are taped up. So I, I understand that he's like laughing and talking about it, you know, and I hope he doesn't untape his hands thinking that, you know, I need to be ready to catch the ball because if he's taping them to protect himself, he needs to keep them taped. <laughs> That's one. Uh, the Sterling Shepard thing, um, and and I know that, that this is not an excuse or anything. He's not really the returner. He's not even listed as one of the returners. Just so you guys know, you're catching balls from a left-footed punter uh, which is a problem. Uh, the ball is drifting a different way and the wind's blowing that it, it's just, it, he, and, the, and the end that he, he missed the ball on wasn't sun glare or anything. 
it's just a left foot left footed punter into the wind and you got to get yourself under the ball and one time he didn't the other time he almost did and you saw once they put Slayton back there the first thing Slayton did was get out of the way when he couldn't get it and the second time he just went under and caught it if you're not used if you're not the guy because you gotta remember the, the guys are um you get the the running back uh then it's great he suffered it, a calf injury it, yeah. it's yeah he is gray it's jackson and then it's slayton those are the guys i'm assuming they didn't want to put slayton back there because they did they, you know starting receiver that he plays a lot of players plays a lot of reps on offense but at the end of the day if he's the third returner you got to get him kind of ready to go and he's gonna have to do it and i know that it's it's a big thing because last year jackson got nicked up in the game and they needed him I don't know how to explain it. I mean, it, Shepard is a, is a great return, you know, great guy, got great hands, but with all the stuff that's going on with the wind and everything and the left footed punter, that was a stretch. <laughs> so no, I was, I, I, I was, I'm, I'm I was not, surprised he made the first two catches when he made them. No, I, I'm not doubting that. That's why I asked you. I knew you were down on the field and mm -hmm. I was on the field a pregame and, and I could feel the wind, but you know, that, that, that return situation, receiving punts for, 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 um, Sterling for Shep, he might not be a return man by trade, but quite frankly, moving forward, you know, with the emergence of Wandell Robinson, mm -hmm. I think making punt returns is where Sterling might have to be uh, to get more game action. Well, again, I, I don't know anything about it. I know they got him on the team for a reason, for whatever reason it is, whether it's encouragement as a captain and, and help the guys for his leadership. But that would not be his strong suit, catching balls, uh, uh, catching punts from left-footed punters in the wind. That because there's no way to practice that unless you unless you can do it with the guns machine or something. But there's, right. there's really no way to practice that. So that's why I'm saying, you know, he'll probably have other games where he's going to be the returner. He'll do great. But if it's a you know something unique, you got to you know put the guy back there with the best best chance of getting it done. Uh, as far as like a uh, Saquon fumbling the ball. Um, I didn't really think that, that was a fumble, but but uh, he fumbled the ball. I think it, you know him trying to cover the ball up and 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 take it into the crowd. You know, if if you notice, two or three times he got up and his arm was dangling. I don't know if he had a stinger or something with his elbow or whatever it was, but he's gonna have to like you know really work at and know that guys are gonna be reaching and pulling at that arm when he goes into the crowd now. Well, he said after the game, Howard, he hyperextended his arm. He says he's going to be okay, but you could tell there was extra padding on the yeah. arm. And Deron Payne made a great play on the ball. As Saquon, remember, was going backwards on his behind, Deron, momentum-wise, is coming from the opposite direction. And he happened to loosen the football. And I think it was a backbreaker play because it wasn't so much the lost fumble. It was where they were on the field, guys. Mm. They were in the red zone. So you went from, at worst, packing on a field goal, perhaps, okay, and making it a two-possession game to now completely missing out on everything. And that's why the accumulation of what Russ was talking about, Howard, it may not be so much, yes, Sterling was put in a position that he normally doesn't encompass, okay? And Avon mm -hmm. is not an offensive player, and he's wearing different tape. Yeah. I understand that. It's just, it's missed opportunities, okay? Whether yeah. they're justified or not, Howard, it's meaning you have a chance to put the game away, and I know he's smiling, and I'll wait for your response, Howard. I'm just, my point is, you have an opportunity to make the game a little bit more comfortable for yourself. That's all I'm saying, where you're not stressing out, you're not waiting for a fourth and goal stop at the mm -hmm. end of the game, and we throw out the cliches of a game of inches, and it's the cumulative effect, because then at the end of the game, you're saying, if Kayvon does this, if Shepard does that, if Saquon does this, and I understand we all like to play the coulda, woulda, shoulda game, but that's to me what we saw front and center in how the game finished. Well, what I'd like to say, you know, in, in, in dispute of what you're saying is they won the game. 100%. And, and, and I'm exact and I'm excited that they got a win. I think that's what you're saying now is that, Hey, they won, but they could have done more. And I, and I get that. I wouldn't go that far, but that's, that's what it, you're it could have been a little bit easier is what no, I'm saying. No, no. That's what I'm saying. This, this is what you're saying. Cause I heard this yesterday cause I do like some of the uh, post game uh, reaction with the fans. And I was laughing as they were like, Oh, they could have done more. How could he just do that? And I'm like, now they won. If they would have lost, this would have been more of a conversation, I think, but they won. 
I'm like, there, there are other plays to be made. In, even when you blow a team out, you can, be, you can also make more plays. But, you know, to, to but, highlight the plays that, that, that are going to be the ones that like, we got to get there. We got to get more of those plays. It's, they're just not going to make them all, all the time. We're happy that this week that, Hey, look, when the guy caught the ball, he ran the ball. He got yards after the catch. We're happy that this week that they had enough time to try to get the ball down the field to, to the deeper, deep receivers. We're happy this week that all of a sudden that the team that's given up a lot of sacks gave up a lot of sacks. Uh, we're also happy that even the guys that we have on the field, even though we don't know all their names sometimes <laughs> on the offensive line, they play just well enough to, you know, to keep a very good front from killing their quarterback and taking them out of the game. Cause I'm like, all right. So if, 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 the, if, uh, if, if he goes out of the game and the last guy comes to the game, like, who do we have after that? I'm like thinking about how many more quarterbacks we have when I looked at that, that offensive line, because I'm like, this could be bad. So the defense does have to carry the team until the offense can get itself up and running. We can say every week that, you know, the defense or the offense should do more. The offense is going to do a little more every week. As you can tell, they went from, you know, possessing the ball to scoring a couple of touchdowns. And I think also you guys got to realize that if you're able to shut a team down, you start calling a different game. You don't put the ball at risk at as much because you know if the play ends with a kick, whether it's a field goal or a punt, we we got them. If this, you know, if we got them, we got them right where we want to. And all we gotta do is keep punting them back deep, and they can't they can't move the ball. That's what the that's kind of what it looked like was happening in the second half. Well, yeah, you're playing with confidence. Yes. <laughs> I don't care if it's you're playing little, with a lead, no matter how big it is. Yeah, you're, you're confident. Yeah. You all of a sudden, I can feel I'm not gonna. Even 14 nothing and 14 7 might seem like just seven points. No, 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 no. 14 nothing. We can breathe. We can be a little loosey goosey. Mm -hmm. Now, 14 7. After that, oh, now it's a football game. Now yeah. we got to worry if they score. Now are they going to go for two? Everything changes. One little mistake, you know, as you bring it out, Howard, listen, the mistakes we don't dwell on. Uh, you and nobody dwells on it when the team wins when a team loses then it's front page headlines you know Absolutely. that's what it is that's just the nature of sports in general mm -hmm. but Howard you also know if you take us through the lens of when you played even after a win okay and it was a close affair the coaching staff is still emphasizing though some of the little things that perhaps he didn't come back to bite you, but need to be corrected moving forward. Or if you played a different opponent, perhaps it could have been a different story. And, and that's what I guess is what I'm alluding at. Not to take yeah, anything but, away, but, 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 but you know, the point, there are things that yeah, always can be cleaned up even in a win. Yeah, but it, but the, the point would be when when you say that is that there'll be games that, that we've played in the past or that the Giants have played in the past that I've played in personally that we demolished the team demolish them and what does the coaching staff do when you go in and watch tape they don't go in and pat you on the back they go in and find everything that you did wrong and they talk to you about it yep. so you know us talking about it, i'm saying like in this particular case the expectation was what was your expectation before the game you're like with this offensive line no one's really playing what well, is hoping to keep it close and no one gets hurt that's what i was hearing all around the stadium people were whispering oh no i don't know i said guys the defense plays really well They'll take, you know, maybe get a couple of takeaways and the offense just can't lose the game. That's how I was viewing the game. And they did, they did a little bit more than not lose the game. They played pretty well, moved the ball down the field, had some big plays, scored some touchdowns, possessed the ball for a long time, kept their defense on the field. So when it was time for them to really try to get after them, they were a little tired. They warmed down a little bit. And I was, I was happy. They, they had a couple runs where, you know, I was talking about how the how the Giants defense was like eight, nine guys, you know, coming to the ball. They had a couple of runs where eight, eight of their guys were on the ground, not 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 because they were tackling, just because they were just it was over. Like they, they were getting beat down. So, you know, the the fumble at the end of the at the end of the game kind of gave them a little life, but they were done. Well, and that's why I was talking about how sometimes you could view a win as a little bit too close to comfort in terms of how it came down to things because of, like you said, the offense not scoring as much in the second half, but the defense, mm -hmm. they made one extra play. You could look at it 
than what happened the previous week against the Buffalo Bills, right? And they didn't play a bad game against the Buffalo Bills. But it also came down to the wire in terms of, you know, needing a stop here, a stop there. And they kept Washington out of the end zone. I think another critical stat that we haven't brought up that deserves a lot of credit and is a big reason why Washington was a bit handicapped in this game is they were one of 15 on third down. And yeah. if you put an opposition in a position where they cannot stay on the field because they cannot convert third downs, I mean, you're pretty much making it virtually impossible for them to have any cohesion whatsoever on offense. And that was huge yesterday. And it wasn't as if, by the way, all the time that Washington was facing third and forevers. There were even some possessions where there were some manageable third downs and the Giants defense still was able to put its foot down and make a stop. I think if there's any statistic that probably tells a big part of the defensive story, it would be more than the pressures and the sacks. It would be the third down defense by the Giants yesterday. Yeah, the third down defense was great for uh, actually for both teams. I think the Giants really only had like four or five third downs themselves that they made. So it, it's a big part of the game with some continuity, trying to keep your keep the flow of the game in the offense. But as far as Washington goes, they couldn't block anybody. I, I, I you know, as bad as our offensive line has been this year, theirs looked a lot worse. So you know, I, I'm like, wow, that's they were getting after them, you know, over yeah. and over and over again, and they took it on the chin. So third down, the first down, whatever down it was, they were getting after the quarterback. And it wasn't like all the sacks. I know that we had six sacks, but there were like plays where they were just hitting the kid over and over again. I'm like, man, he's a tough kid. He's got some bruises all over his body for sure. Hey, you know, one guy we haven't mentioned, and I think it deserves mentioning because he's having himself a very solid season, is the punter, Jamie Gillen. He's having himself a very dependable, solid season. He was very sharp yesterday. Yeah, he did a good. He did a good job. I think the coverage team did a great job. You know, with uh, a returner that that is, that's a known returner that has had some success against a lot of team, but they were all over him. They they knew how to get down the field to get around him. Uh, it wasn't any like big gaps in the in the in the coverage team. I thought that was impressive. Uh, I'm still a little worried about our kickoff team, uh, and I'm hoping they, we kick the ball through the end zone as much as possible because I think if if a team wants to return it with us, you know, the way we we cover kind of to the 30 and we're kind of cruising down, and if the if the ball is kicked just outside the end zone or one yard deep and a guy brings it out, he's going to have a full head of speed before they figure out they need to kick it in another gear to run that, that extra 10 to 15 yards to get to him. Well, you're referring to Jamison Crowder, Howard, who actually was with the Giants this offseason. But the last thing you want to do, especially in a game yesterday, is give the opposition favorable starting field position. Because That's once right. again, it's not a coincidence that the commander's lone touchdown came off of an extremely short field. Yeah. So that's more of a reason why, to your point, both of you, special teams, you don't want to be talking about special teams because you don't want to be laying out the red carpet treatment to the opposition, especially in a low-scoring battle. And we weren't talking about that yesterday. So that was also another facet that at least made strides in the right direction. Exactly. Exactly. And with that, I think that is a good point to wrap up our discussion here on the Giants Hangout as the Giants snap a four-game skid with a win over the Commanders 14-7. to 7. This is our weekly roundtable discussion. We recap the previous game. We look ahead and also focus on three different themes. And today, of course, it was the defense. It was explosive plays and some missed opportunities to maybe put some points on the board. Lance Meadow, Russ Salzburg, Howard Cross with you. Stay locked to the Giants Hangout, which you can follow on Giants.com, the mobile app, and your favorite podcast platform.